tell a rather dark story by Frederick Brown, The House, published in 1960. This is a strange story. Most of the stories I tell are stories that I understand. This story is an exception to the rule. I don't really understand what it means. I have a theory, which I will share with you after I tell the story, but it is just a theory. And it turns out that many people have offered theories about what this story means. I'm hoping this story will generate some good discussion. The House. He hesitated upon the porch and looked a last long look upon the road behind him and the green trees that grew beside it and the yellow fields and the distant hill and the bright sunlight. Then he opened the door and entered and the door swung shut behind him. He turned as it clicked and saw only a blank wall. There was no knob and no keyhole and the edges of the door, if there were edges, were so cunningly fitted into the car paneling that he could not discern its outline. Before him lay the cobwebbed hallway. The floor was thick with dust, and through the dust wound two so slender curving trails, as might have been made by two very small snakes, or two very large caterpillars. The trails were very faint, he did not notice them until he was opposite the first doorway to the right. Upon the door was the inscription Semper Fidelis in Old English lettering. Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Beyond this door, he found himself in a small red room, no larger than a large closet. A single chair in this room lay on its side, one leg broken and dangling by a thin splinter. Upon the nearest wall, the only picture was a framed portrait of Benjamin Franklin. It hung askew, and the glass covering it was cracked. There was no dust upon the floor, and the room appeared to have been recently cleaned. In the center of the floor lay a bright curved scimitar. There were red stains upon its hilt, and along the edge of the blade, was a thick coating of green ooze. Aside from these things, the room was empty. He stood in this room for a long time and then crossed the hallway and entered the room opposite. It was large, the size of a small auditorium, but the bare black walls made it seem smaller at first glance. There was row upon row of purple plush theater seats, but there was no stage, and the rows of seats started only a few inches from the blank wall they faced. There was nothing else in the room, but upon the nearest seat lay a neat pile of programs. One of these he took and found it blank, save for two advertisements on the back cover, one for prophylactic toothbrushes, and the other for choice building lots in the Sub Rosa subdivision. On a page near the front of the program, he saw that someone had written, with a lead pencil, the name Garfinkel. He thrust this program into his pocket and returned to the hallway, along which he walked in search of the stairs. Behind one closed door which he passed, he heard someone picking out tunes on what sounded like a Hawaiian guitar. He knocked upon this door, but the only answer was scurrying footsteps and then silence. When he opened the door and peered within, he saw only a decaying corpse hanging from the chandelier and an odor hurled itself upon him so nauseating that he quickly closed the door and walked onto the stairway the stairway was narrow and winding. There was no banister, and he clung close to the wall as he ascended. He saw that the first seven steps from the bottom had been scrubbed clean, but in the dust above the seventh step, 
he saw again the two winding trails. On the third step from the top, they converged and then vanished. He entered the first door to the right and found himself in a spacious bedroom, lavishly furnished. He crossed immediately to the carved poster bed and pulled aside the curtains. The bed was neatly made and he saw a piece of paper pinned to the pillow. Upon it was written hastily in a woman's handwriting, Denver, 1909. Upon the reverse side, neatly written in another handwriting, was an algebraic equation. He left this room quietly and stopped short just outside the door. He heard a sound coming from behind a black doorway across the hall. It was the deep voice of a man chanting in a strange and unfamiliar tongue. It rose and fell in a monotonous cadence, like a Buddhist hymn. The voice sounded like his own voice, but muffled by many things. He bowed his head and stood until the voice died away into a trembling silence and twilight crept into the hallway with the stealth of a practiced thief. Then, as though awakening, he walked along the now silent hallway until he was opposite the third and last door. He saw that they had printed his name on the upper panel in tiny gold letters. Perhaps radium had been mixed with the gold for the letters glowed in the dim hallway he stood for a long time with his hand upon the knob, and then at last he entered and closed the door behind him. He heard the click of the latch and knew that it would never open again. And yet he felt no fear with this realization. The darkness was a black, tangible thing that sprung back from him when he struck a match. He saw then that the room was a counterpart to the east bedroom of his father's house near Wilmington, the room in which he had been born. He knew now just where to look for candles. There were two in the drawer and the stump of a third. And he knew that burned one at a time, they would last for nearly 10 hours. He lighted the first and stood it in the brass bracket on the wall. It cast dancing shadows from each chair and from the bed, and from the small cradle that stood beside the bed. Upon the table beside his mother's sewing basket lay the March 1877 issue of Harper's Magazine. He picked it up and looked idly through his pages. At length, he dropped it to the floor. He thought tenderly of his wife who had died many years ago. A faint smile trembled upon his lips as he remembered dozens of little incidents from the years of their days and nights together. He thought too of many other things as the minutes went by. It was not until the ninth hour when but half an inch of candle remained and darkness gathered in the farther corners of the room and crept closer, that he screamed and beat and clawed at the door until his hands were a raw and bloody pulp. I think you'll agree it's a strange story. Before I tell you my interpretation, I want to encourage all of you to pause this video for a while and think about the story on your own. What do you think it means? Give it some thought and please share your thoughts with me. My email address is larry.home at gmail.com. You can also reply to the email I sent with a link to this video. So give it some thought and then if you like, come back and resume the video. 
Welcome back. There are discussions of this story online, and many people have offered theories about what the story means. Some of these theories are based on literary schools of thought. Uh, for example, there's an interpretation based on Cubism, another based on Gnosticism, another based on um, Ziegler, another based on Derrida. I found none of them to be convincing. So here's my take. There are two things about the story that really struck me. First, it seems to be about death. Certainly what happens in the last room suggests that. Second, the story is very dreamlike. Many bizarre things happen that we do not understand, very much like in a dream. Putting these two thoughts together, I suggest that the entire story is the depiction of a dream. This man is dreaming about his own death. Perhaps the man having the dream is himself very near death. In any event, I suggest that at the beginning of the dream, he has made peace with himself and he has come to accept the inevitable end of his life. So he comes to this house to die. He looks a last long look upon the road behind him, the green trees, the yellow fields, the bright sunlight. He's taking one last look at life. Then he enters the house and sees immediately that there's no way out. He goes from room to room, encountering bizarre things. I think he is in some fashion reviewing his life. Each room represents some random memory from his lifetime. We don't understand all of the things that he encounters, but we can make some, some reasonable guesses. For example, the first room has upon the door the inscription Semper Fidelis, which was the Marine's motto. Maybe he was a Marine. Maybe the scimitar with the red stains upon its hilt represents some incident that occurred when he was a Marine. The next room has the rows of theater seats with no stage. Maybe he wanted to be an actor. Maybe he tried to be an actor and never succeeded. The next room has the decaying corpse hanging from the chandelier. Maybe he witnessed an execution by hanging. Or maybe he knew someone who committed suicide. He goes up the stairs and enters the spacious bedroom, lavishly furnished. Maybe that was the bedroom he shared with his wife of many years. Eventually, he comes to the last door and sees that they've prepared it for him. They've printed his name on the upper panel. He goes inside, closes the door, and knows that it will never never open again. And yet he feels no fear with this realization. Why? Because he has made peace with himself. He strikes a match and sees that the room is a counterpart to the room in which he had been born. He has now come full circle. He lights a candle and waits patiently for his death. But as the hours go by, I think he gradually comes to realize that he's not really prepared to die. Maybe he thought he was, but when the moment is fast approaching and he realizes that very soon he will breathe his last breath, I think he comes to realize that he is in fact terrified of death. And so he tries desperately to escape the room. But of course, there is no escape from death. That's my interpretation. I will share one more thought. I think that the author, Frederick Brown, is making an, an interesting suggestion about death. Um, sort of an interesting insight. I think he's suggesting in this story that no matter how well prepared you might think you are for death, you won't know what your last moments will be like until you get there. Those are my thoughts. Thank you for listening.